So as we start this series of lessons, which we've titled Discovering Christ in Unexpected Places, we're going to turn to the book of John, the Gospel of John, if you would please, the Gospel of John chapter 5. We have some key texts that we want to look at that will, I think, help us get focused on this subject. And so John chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse um, 39 of the Gospel of John chapter 5. And uh, if you have one of those Bibles that uh, uses red letters for the words of Jesus, you'll notice that there's a whole lot of red letters on this page. But they actually start on the previous page, at least in my Bible. They start back up around John chapter 5 and, well, they're kind of scattered through there, John 5 and 19 and so forth. But uh, notice, first of all, who, we're, who Jesus is speaking to here. Let's go to John chapter 5 and verse 16 so we can know the audience that Jesus is addressing. This is John chapter 5, verse 16. For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. And then verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And so then there in verse 19, you can see that Jesus begins to speak to these, uh, the Jewish folks who at that time had rejected him. And let's see what he says when we get down to the Gospel of John chapter 5 and verse 39. Here's where we're beginning our study for today. John 5 and verse 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Now, a couple of things here before we read any further. We're going to read down to the end of this chapter, but let's stop here for just a moment. And notice, first of all, that when he talks about the scriptures here, he, of course, is talking about what we call the Old Testament. The New Testament had not yet even begun to be written at the time that Jesus said these words. The only scripture that existed was the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And Jesus says to them, you search the scriptures. It was customary for devout Jews at that time, and even today among some devout Jews, to think that just by studying the scriptures, they will gain eternal life. Just by reading the scriptures, studying them, and they can get very enthusiastic about reading the scriptures. But the problem here was that they were searching the scriptures because they thought they would gain eternal life by doing that. But Jesus went on to say in verse 39, these are they which testify of me. So the point there is Jesus is saying the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament commonly, they are really about Jesus Christ. All right. And so as we begin this series of lessons on discovering Christ in unexpected places, we will discover him in the Old Testament, perhaps in places we've not previously looked or noticed. But he says, they speak of me. Now, what we're going to do, I hope, in this series of lessons is gain a new appreciation for the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes we think, well, we don't really need that. That's just, you know, we have the New Testament, so we don't really need that. But when we discover the Hebrew scriptures are really the really central focus of the Hebrew scriptures is about Jesus, then that should make us more excited to read those scriptures and to discover Christ there and what they have to say about him. Now, picking up in verse 40, after having said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. In the very next verse, Jesus say, says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So even though they were searching the scriptures, they didn't see Christ in the scriptures and they weren't willing to come to him. By the way, the only way we can have eternal life is to know Jesus. There's no other way to, to that. And so let's continue reading now in verse 41. We're in John chapter five, gospel of John five and verse 41. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Verse 44, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? 
Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. Now, these last couple of verses here are very significant for what we want to say in this series of lessons. Verse 46, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Now, when Jesus says Moses wrote about him, he's talking about the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Sometimes we call it the Pentateuch. Sometimes we call it the Torah. It's Moses represented in those five books. And so these unbelieving Jews that Jesus is speaking to here says, you know, you think you believe Moses, you read Moses, you search the scriptures thinking that in them you're going to have eternal life, but they speak of me. If you really believed Moses, you would believe me because I'm the one that Moses wrote about. Now, maybe we're not used to thinking of Moses writing about Jesus. But the Old Testament is used abundantly and generously in the New Testament to speak of Christ. In fact, just in the book of Deuteronomy, there's nearly 70 references in the New Testament to the book of Deuteronomy. And we need to be aware of that because that book of Deuteronomy is not just a book for people of old, it's a book for us. It shows up in the New Testament. And then Jesus says in verse 47, some folks want to deny that Moses actually wrote, but look at verse 47. If you do not believe his writings, that is Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? So to believe Moses and to believe Jesus, are, it's really bound up together. To do one is to do the other if you recognize that Moses was writing about Jesus. Now you may think, well, I'm not really sure where Moses wrote about Jesus. Well, that's the challenge that we face, isn't it? If Jesus said it's about me, then we want to go back there. We want to read those books. We want to try to discover all that we can about Jesus from Moses' writings. And really the entire Bible after Moses' writing, springs from what Moses wrote. That's foundational. That's the very beginning of uh, really even of the gospel message we find there in Moses' writings. Amen. So there's a beginning point for us. Now let's go from there to the gospel of Luke. And this is a text that I frequently go over with, uh, uh, with people, and we may have started our last series uh, three months ago, we perhaps started here, uh, but um, we have some new students in the class today, so we're going to go back there, and I always love to go through this. This is Luke chapter 24. After Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and uh, we're picking up at Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. Now behold, two of them, these are two disciples of Jesus. This is the two who were on the Emmaus Road. You know that story. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. That's the death and the burial of, of Jesus. So it was while they conversed and reasoned, that Je uh, and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Verse 17, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? I love this text. Jesus interacts with these people. Uh, I, I'm sure he knew what kind of conversation they were having, but he's try, seeking to draw them out. What are you guys talking about and why are you so sad? Verse 18, then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? <laughs> yeah, he wants, he wants them to get engaged with this conversation with him. So uh, he said to them, what things? And so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. 
and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Notice that. They realized that a redeemer was coming to redeem Israel. They were hoping it was Jesus. But they said, indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. We'll come back to that third day question just a little bit later in this text. Verse 22, yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So this is after Jesus died. His resurrection. Jesus is right there talking with them. So... They're not aware. They know what the women said. Now, we could talk about that a little bit because of the first century attitude about women and the reliability of their witness. They were not allowed to testify, for example, in a court of law in the first century. They were not allowed to own property. They were considered to be property. Uh, they were not considered really to be trustworthy. And so when these women went to uh, the disciples and said, we have seen Jesus... Well, Peter and John said, we better go check this out for ourselves. We really can't rely on what they said. <laughs> so they went to check it out, and sure enough, Jesus, he wasn't there. They weren't quite sure what had happened, but like the women said, he wasn't there. We do need to keep in mind that women are the first to have preached the gospel. They are. They really are. The gospel is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And those women came back from that empty tomb and told the, the male disciples Jesus had risen. That's the proclamation of the gospel. Amen. They were the first ones to do that. Now, let me ask you this question. Let's look at verse 24 of Luke uh, 24 once again. I want to ask you a question. And certain of those who, went, who were with us went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Now, how do you suppose Jesus would have responded to them at this point in time? These men are sad. They had hoped Jesus was going to be the one to redeem Israel. Apparently, their hope was false because he was dead as far as they knew. It's just missing from the tomb, but they didn't know what that meant. And so you might expect Jesus to embrace them and say, oh, you guys, I feel so sorry for you. Look, it's me. I'm risen. Uh, pat them on the back, perhaps. Try to comfort them a little bit. That's not what he did. Verse 25, then he said to them, oh, foolish ones. <laughs> oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Now, when he says prophets, he means the Old Testament prophets here. Then Jesus says in verse 26, Ought not the Christ, and of course the word Christ is the, word for, the Greek word for Messiah, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? See how he connects that with what the prophets said. You don't believe what the prophets said. The prophets foretold that the Messiah would suffer and enter his glory, which indicates right there that he wouldn't stay dead. He was going to enter his glory. But they hadn't been able to believe that. So in verse 27, I love verse 27. I'd give anything if I had this record, a recording of this lesson right here. I would just sit down and play the recording for you. Because verse 27 says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Isn't that great? Like in John chapter 5 where he said, Moses wrote of me. Here he begins at Moses. That means he begins at Genesis. He begins at Exodus. He begins at Numbers and Leviticus. He begins at Deuteronomy, and he expounds to them the things concerning himself. When you're reading those early books, are you looking for Jesus there? Are you saying, oh, more sacrifices, 
More laws. Oh, am I ever going to get through this? Jesus says these books are about him. He taught these two disciples about himself from Moses' writings. All right, verse 28. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Now, let me just tell you, we're going to see this here, but we're going to see it later this morning. If you don't read the Hebrew scriptures with a Christ-centered consciousness, they are a closed book to you. If you don't see Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures, they are closed to you. He opened the scriptures to us, and the way he did that was by showing them from Moses and all the prophets the things concerning himself. Now, verse 33, so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying... The Lord is risen indeed, it has appeared to Simon. Of course, that is uh, Peter. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. <coughs> wonderful, wonderful story. But we're not finished yet. Now, the next several verses, 36 through 43, it's wonderful. Jesus appears to the disciples as a group. He eats with them and so forth. But we want to pick up in verse 44. This is Luke chapter 24 and now verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. What are we seeing here? Jesus is really focused here on the fact that the Old Testament is about him. Now, when he refers to the law and the prophets and the Psalms, that's the three sections of the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. The law, the first five books. Now, in the order of the books in the Hebrew Bible, the next section is the prophets. It's a different order than we have in the English translations. And then in the Hebrew Bible, the third section is what's called the Psalms, sometimes also called the writings. It includes not only the book of Psalms, but all the books that come after that in the Hebrew order. I don't want you to worry about that because the content of the books is the same, whether you read it in the Hebrew Bible or whether you read it in an English translation. As far as the books are concerned, it's all the same. But the order of the books is different. We may think that's not important, but Jesus here endorses the order of the books as they're found in the Hebrew Bible. Notice, he says the law, then the prophets, then the Psalms, or again, the writings. But it includes all of the books. The books of the Old Testament are uh, not only ordered differently in the Hebrew Bible, but there's also a different number of them. In our Old Testaments, we have 39 books. The way they're arranged in the Hebrew Bible, there's 24, even some count it as 22. But again, the actual content is the same. So if you ever read anything about, well, we've got a different number of books in the Old Testament, that's true in the Hebrew Bible. But again, the content's the same. For example, in the Hebrew Scriptures, you don't have First and Second Samuel. You got Samuel. You don't have First and Second Kings and all of that. Not, not all these divisions, like we have in our English translations. But Jesus endorsed that order. So that's what I'm talking about right now. It's kind of a self-interpretive order. We can't get into all of that. But Jesus said, 
everything that is written concerning me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So when you read the Psalms, do you look for Jesus? That's one of the things we're going to do in this class. That's going to be the main thing we do in this class. This is just kind of introductory today. The book of Psalms is quoted or paraphrased or um, uh, referred to in the New Testament in about 200 places. The book of Psalms is the most frequently referenced Old Testament book in the New Testament. Have you ever noticed going into a Christian bookstore, sometimes you might see you can pick up a copy of the New Testament and the Psalms? How many's ever noticed that? The New Testament and the Psalms. Have you ever tried to go in and pick up a New Testament and Obadiah? <laughs> You'll never find it that way. It's the New Testament and Psalms. And uh, one of the reasons for that is because the book of Psalms is so thoroughly connected with the New Testament. It's the main source, in fact, of the uh, use of the Old Testament and the New. Okay, so we want to continue along here in Luke chapter uh, 24, picking up in verse 45. After Jesus says, everything that is written concerning me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he goes on to, in verse 45 of Luke 24, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Once again, you comprehend the scriptures when you read them with a Christ-centered consciousness. Then verse 46, and I really want you to see this. We are apostolics here, and I think you will enjoy especially these last few verses that we're going to read. Verse 46, then he said to them, thus it is written, that means the Old Testament, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Jesus has just said that in the Old Testament you will read not only about the sufferings of Christ, you will also read about his resurrection on the third day. Amen. Now where do we read about the resurrection of Christ on the third day in the Old Testament? Any ideas? Now, we know we read about his resurrection there, but what about the idea that his resurrection would actually be on the third day? Where can we find that in the Old Testament? Any thoughts? Right. Thank you. It usually takes people a while to think that over. Jesus, uh, Jesus is answering the uh, Pharisees one day who said, we want a sign from you. He said, it's a wicked and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. That is, Jonah was three days and three nights in the, our heart of the fish or the whale's belly or whatever he called it there. He said, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, you see, you and I, if we didn't know that, we would never see the story of Jesus in the book of Jonah, would we? We think it's a story about a reluctant prophet and a big fish. That's it. But when Jesus himself read the book of Jonah, he saw his own story there and said, just as Jonah was in that whale's belly, so I will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Anybody think of any other place where we might discover that Christ would be resurrected uh, before the fourth day in the Old Testament? If you want to go with me to one of our favorite chapters in the Bible, Acts chapter 2. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. Peter is preaching nearly his entire sermon, basically it consists of quotations from the Old Testament. Book of Joel, you know, he starts out, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So that's a big part of his message, but that's not the only place he refers to the Old Testament in his sermon. Go down in the book of Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading at verse 25. Acts chapter 2 and verse 25. And speaking of Jesus here, you can read the whole sermon to see that that's the context here. Speaking of Jesus, uh, Peter says in Acts 2, uh, 25, For David says concerning him, 
Now, earlier we read about how Moses speaks of Jesus. Now, who do you think is being referred to here when he says David? What book would that be? Psalms, of course, yes. So he says, David says concerning him, meaning concerning Jesus. And then he quotes from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. So now Peter believed that Psalm 16, 8 through 11 was about Jesus. Now, if we just read Psalm 16, 8 through 11 without any awareness of this, we might not see that. But Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, the first Pentecostal message. He's preaching about Christ, winds up with 3,000 people being filled with the Spirit and all of that. And so quoting from Psalm 16, Peter says, For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I might not, may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. Now notice that phrase. These are the words of the Messiah here. My flesh also shall rest in hope. And the very next line, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. The King James translates that hell. The Hades is just simply a transliteration of the Greek word that's here. You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So my flesh, obviously this is referring to his death. You will not leave my soul in Hades. You will not allow my flesh to corrupt. Verse 28 you have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence, end quote. That's all from Psalm 16. Now, Peter is going to explain this to us. Here it is, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So, let me just assure you, David's flesh corrupted. It's still corrupt. He's still in that tomb somewhere. He'd been dead for centuries when Peter said this. But the psalm was not about David. It was about Jesus, as we'll see as we go on and read. He says in verse 30, Therefore, being a prophet, David was a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So in other words, that tells us that the psalm, of course, is about Christ. But what we're talking about right now is, does the Old Testament mention his resurrection on the third day? Well, Jonah is certainly one of those evidences. But how many of you remember the story of, um, of Lazarus? Lazarus is sick. His sisters contact, they send word to Jesus. Our brother is sick, please come. So the Bible tells us Jesus stayed where he was for a while. He doesn't go. He waits a while, then he goes. He has a reason for doing this. And to cut that story a little br uh, briefer than it actually is, you know that Jesus stood before Lazarus' tomb and said, roll away the stone. One of the sisters said, he's been dead four days. He's stinking. You see, they didn't embalm in those days, but they did treat a, uh, a corpse with spices that would preserve that body for three days. But on the fourth, it was over. And so Lazarus had been dead four days. But Jesus said from this prophecy in Psalm 16, you will not allow my, your Holy One to see corruption. So that means he had to be resurrected from the dead before the fourth day. So there's another kind of indirect way of seeing that the Old Testament did foretell the resurrection of Jesus before the fourth day, which means, of course, on the third day. Okay. Now, let's go back to Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. So in verse 46, Jesus had said, Thus it is written, 
And thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now verse 47. See if you recognize any of these words. And it's also written, notice he's still talking about what's written in the Hebrew scriptures here. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Do you recall Peter on the day of Pentecost saying anything about repentance? Did he say anything about remission of sins? <laughs> Jesus himself says that message comes from the Old Testament. He says that this would be preached in his name and to all nations, but that it would begin in Jerusalem. You know, Jesus told the disciples, you go and wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. He didn't tell them to go there because Jerusalem had better conference facilities than any other city. That wasn't the reason. It's because the Old Testament prophesied the Spirit would be poured out first in Jerusalem. So go there and wait. It wouldn't have worked to go to Bethany or somewhere else. Go to Jerusalem and wait there. He says that's written in the scriptures. And then he says in verse 48, You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Where is that promise of the Father found? It's found in the Old Testament. I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem. Wait there until you are endued with power from on high. Now, these are kind of typical texts underscoring the fact that if we want to discover Jesus, we can't look only in the New Testament. We have to look in the Old Testament as well because the Old Testament is about him. Now, I have another text I want to take you to, and that is 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Going to be some things here that may be a little shocking, but things that we need to be aware of in this series of lessons we're going to be doing over the next several weeks. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to start reading at verse 4. Of course, this is Paul who has now become thoroughly convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And that convincing occurred when in Acts chapter 9, he is arrested, so to speak, on his way to further persecute the church in Damascus. And suddenly a bright light shines from heaven. He falls down to the ground. And Paul says, we're calling him Saul at that time, but he says, Who art thou, Lord? And he hears this voice from heaven that says, The Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. What? Brother Graham preached such a message, a wonderful message on this two or three Sundays ago about Saul's conversion. <laughs> All it took was a word from heaven for him to be thoroughly converted and completely turned around from his life of persecution of the church to the place of preaching the gospel right there in the book of Acts chapter 9. So this is, he's the one who's writing this, okay? So let's hear what he has to say. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 4. And we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Now there's such a thing as an old covenant and a new covenant. Jesus himself referred to that new covenant at what we call the last supper when he gives them to drink and to eat and says this is the blood of the new covenant that is shed for you. So Jesus himself introduces that phrase there. Of course it's found in the prophecies of the Old Testament as well. But uh, Paul says here that uh, he has been made sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. Now, when he says the letter, he's referring to the old covenant, as we'll see in just a moment. He says, that's not what I'm talking about now. That's what he was at before. But he says, now we're talking about the spirit, not the letter. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. You're going to see in just a moment what he means here is that old covenant, the law of Moses, did not impart life. In fact, it was deadly. Yeah. 
But the new covenant, the covenant of the Spirit, imparts life. So verse 7, there is a reason why we're reading this today in connection with the topic that we're going to be discussing over these next weeks. Verse 7, but if the ministry of death, now remember he has just said the letter kills, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious. Now what do you suppose he's talking about when he says written and engraved on stones? What could that be? The Ten Commandments, of course. Amen. That was written on stones. All great commandments and everything, but it was not able to impart life to anybody. He says, the ministry of death written and engraved on stones, if that was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance. We'll stop there for just a moment. You remember the, remember the story, don't you? Moses comes down from the mountain. His face is shining from that, in, that intimate encounter with God. So brilliant, the people can't look at his face. And so he puts this veil over his face. Now keep that in mind. He wore that veil for a long time. You'll see that just in a few verses here. So if it was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, it was a fading glory. Verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit, that's the new covenant, not be more glorious? Was there glory associated with that old covenant? Oh, yes. There was thunder. There was lightning. There was lots of noise and everything. It was a glorious event. But the new covenant is much more glorious than the old covenant. I'm really puzzled over why people want to go back to the law of Moses. I mean, to me, the New Testament is so clear on this. For that matter, even the Old Testament is clear on it. that The law was never given to be an, an eternal covenant. It was given for temporary purposes. Having accomplished its purposes, read the book of Galatians, it's done. Christ has come, and he's the one we're focused on. We're under this new covenant, not the old covenant. All right, now verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, now what covenant is he talking about there in this context? Still the law of Moses, the old covenant. It was a covenant of death. It was a covenant that killed. It was a covenant of condemnation. How excited can you get about that? <laughs> That's motivating, isn't it? All right. But if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness, that's the new covenant, exceeds much more in glory. I mean, that's something to be excited about. Verse 10, for even what was made glorious, meaning the old covenant, had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. In other words, if you compare the glory of the new covenant with the glory of the old covenant, Really, that's not even glory of the Old Covenant in comparison with what's happening in our lives now by the power of the Holy Spirit, the coming of Christ under the New Covenant. All right, now verse um, 11. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Verse 12. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, Verse 13, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. If you read the Old Testament carefully about that, Moses would put that, he would take the veil off when he went into the presence of the Lord because the Lord knew that glory had already faded. But when he would come back out to meet the people, he'd put the veil back on. So they could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. As long as Moses wore that veil, everybody figured, his face is still shiny. <laughs> There's such a thing as wearing a mask. You know, some of us do that. So they thought, yeah, under that veil. Now, kids, if you could look under that veil, boy, he's got a shiny face. But... He just went ahead and took it off when he went in the presence of the Lord. Now, verse 14. But their minds were blinded. Now, this is so important for our topic here today. 
their minds, these people under that old covenant, their minds were blinded for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. When you read the Old Testament without a Christ-centered consciousness, there is a veil over your eyes. If you read it looking for Jesus, that veil is taken away. Look at the next verse. He says in verse 15, But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart, meaning the hearts of those who do not know Jesus. Nevertheless, verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Praise God. Let's read the Old Testament with faith in Jesus Christ, looking for him there. Because when we do that, this darkness, this veil, this dullness, these yawns, it's all taken away when we look for Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures. Praise God. And then... We want to finish this uh, chapter here. Verse 17, I love this. We often read it without any concern for the context, but this verse is even more powerful when you look at the context of it. Now where the Lord, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Wow. What that means is you have not had liberty in the reading of the Hebrew Scriptures before, before you came to Christ. But now that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and you know him, you have this great liberty in the reading of the Old Testament. Amen. You're not going to fall asleep reading it. <laughs> You're going to be excited reading it because it's about Jesus. Verse 18, And we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, and by the way, James uses that idea of a mirror concerning the scriptures, the Old Testament specifically. And so beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord as being and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So let me ask you a question as we conclude. Do you want to be transformed from glory to glory? then join us in this journey from week to week of reading the Old Testament, looking for Jesus there, and finding how the Old Testament will just unfold to us. Now, we're going to focus specifically on the book of Psalms. But I didn't want to just say Psalms, because you've just seen in these texts today, it's not only Psalms. Jesus said, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms are about me. Let's have a closing prayer here. Heavenly Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you. Thank you for unfolding to us that Jesus Christ is the central message of the scriptures. I pray that you would help us to have understanding and clarity of thought as we read the Bible. Help us, I pray, to be transformed thereby. Let our love for you be deepened. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.